Hello, and welcome to the Argyle Financial Controller Leadership Forum, Predict, Plan, Prepare. My name is Nick with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. A couple of notes before I turn things over to our panel moderator. First, a quick reminder to stop by our sponsors' virtual booths at any time during today's event and for the following week. Our partners are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. At any time during today's event, you can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page, which include complimentary materials, information, and meet and greet opportunities. Throughout today's event, you will also have the opportunity to win one of several prizes. So be sure to check out the prizes and raffle rules tab of the interface to see how you can earn points. For those seeking CPE credit today, you must answer at least three polling questions and remain on the session for its duration. Polls can be found under the polls tab on the right hand side of your console next to chat. Afterwards, if you're eligible to receive credit, you will receive an email with a link to your certificates. If you have any questions on credits, please email cpe at argyleforum.com. To ask questions throughout the session, simply type into the Q&A chat and we will address your questions at the end of the session. Now, without further delay, I would like to introduce our moderator, Swetha T. Pai, Chief Financial Officer, VCM Products. We're super excited to have Swetha and our panelists for panel discussion titled Evolution of the Financial Controller. Welcome, Swetha. Over to you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Nick, um, hi everyone. I'm Shweta Pai. I'm honored to be moderating today's discussion on the evolution of the financial controller. Um, as a quick intro, over the past 20 plus years, my career has spanned uh, a range of financial leadership role across a variety of different industries. I've worked in investment banking, um, corporate strategy, FP&A. I've worked uh, on uh, complex M&A transactions as well as uh, leading FP&A uh, teams globally for large multinationals, as well as uh, worked in uh, small startups um, uh, as CFO um, for them doing fundraising, et cetera. So throughout my career, what I've seen is I witnessed how the controller role has really transformed. Um, and I'm excited to talk about what this uh, looks like for uh, the future and uh, discuss this more with our esteemed panelists here. Um, so let me just um, turn it over to them and uh, and kind of let them talk about their unique perspective and experience and uh, uh, and let them introduce themselves. So um, let's start with Julian. Um, Julian, do you mind introducing yourself and sharing a quick overview of your experience and how it connects with today's theme? Thank you, uh, uh, Swetha. Appreciate that. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Julian Sifliku. Uh, I'm the current uh, financial controller for Crow Company here in Michigan. Uh, very, very excited, uh, along with my fellow panelists here, to be uh, in this, uh, you know, uh, panel uh, discussion and uh, also to participate in this great audience that we have uh, as well. A little bit about me. Uh, uh, all my career has been in retail. Uh, I started selling seafood uh, as a seafood clerk, and then uh, uh, I moved into the management uh, for about 10, 10 plus years, uh, was a store leader, uh, and then uh, uh, had some uh, roles within, you know, the uh, executive team, uh, either uh, uh, operation or merchandising, and then moved into finance, uh, uh, starting early finance as a a financial analyst and then assistant controller, controller CFO in different states uh, throughout the U.S. Uh, so as you can see from my uh, introduction here, uh, very, very, uh, uh, you know, a great experience on how you move up in, in, into finance role in your organization and uh, um, have a passion for numbers, a passion for people, and uh, looking forward to, to this great uh, discussion we're going to have today. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm going to move it all to Phil, right, Philip? Yep. Yeah, Julian, thank you. So uh, I'm Philip Peck. I'm currently Vice President of Advisory Services and Finance Transformation for Peloton Consulting Group. 
Our company helps organizations drive digital transformation across their enterprise. We do advisory work, which I'm typically involved in, pure consulting work and also managed services work across an array of different technology platforms and related uh, business process improvement areas. For me personally, I've spent 35 plus years in FP&A, in finance and controllership in a variety of different corporate roles. I've led FP&A functions. I've been a business controller. I've been a financial controller. Like you, Shweta, I did some M&A work way back in the day. And then I pivoted into consulting. So helping organizations in large part explore the art of the possible, adopt leading edge practices across FP&A finance and controllership functions. Really looking forward to the discussion because I know we've got just uh, a tremendous uh, group of peoples here that we're going to share hopefully lots of insights and wisdom for all of you in the audience. Great. Thanks, Philip. Uh, next is uh, Dan Miller. Hi, everyone. Dan Miller. I, I guess I'm the tech guy. I spent my entire career in technology out in Silicon Valley and then um, um, really in a variety of stages like Swetha. Um, in uh, currently CFO of RightRev, which is a technology that completes the process of complex revenue recognition and lease accounting. Um, but I've also done much larger companies. I was vice president of finance at NetSuite, a uh, cloud ERP company, and then also uh, CFO of Nexa, which is about a $500 million company located in San Francisco, uh, energy software and services. And then was also vice president, controller, uh, vice president and controller for a very large networking company, big IPO, et cetera. Um, and hopefully those sort of multi-stage experiences um, kind of will hopefully contribute a bit to the discussion. Look forward to it. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Dan. And last but not least, Samantha Singer. Hi. Um, Gindi. Gindi. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Samantha Singer. My background, like most people on the panel, comes originally from accounting. So I did public practice for about eight years. Um, and then I transitioned into the role of a controller, director of finance in both the restoration and hospitality industry. And I've been doing that for about uh, 13 years. Right now, I'm currently working for a company called Levy Canada. We're actually an international uh, company under the umbrella of Compass, and we provide our premium food and beverage services to our uh, NHL hockey team in Montreal. So that's where I'm at right now. And I have vast experience in different types of hospitality and restaurants. So I'm the food and beverage girl. <laughs> Perfect. Great experience across the board. Um, so let's get started. So um, for uh, to start the discussion, um, just broadly, I um, want to ask the panel to talk about how, how they've balanced or how they've seen controllers really balance kind of the traditional roles with new responsibilities as we have more technology, data-driven responsibilities coming on uh, on the, uh, you know, on the board as far as what comes within the controllership function, um, if where controllers are no longer just focused on maintaining accurate financial reporting and compliance. They're asked to do a lot more and even kind of go and really partner with fp &A. So how, how have you seen this work effectively, this balance of traditional roles for controllers as well as these new responsibilities, especially given the technology that has been coming on stream? I'll start with you, Julian, uh, if you can provide some real world examples, any thoughts, et cetera. Thank you, uh, Swetha. You know, uh, that's exactly as you said. Uh, the world is evolving, it's changing. And the control of the world that was like five years ago, as a matter of fact, and I can do it like pre COVID and after COVID because a lot of things changed. Uh, mm -hmm. Sort of, you know, it's completely different nowadays. Uh, before I remember myself, uh, when I started as a financial analyst, uh, uh, doing a lot of entries, a lot of manual entries. Uh, and and uh, uh, trying to uh, do a lot of reporting myself and with my teams as well, putting a lot of data in. Fast forward, fast forward. Uh, you move into a controller role, and especially with a new landscape right now, either micro or, or micro, you know, economic changes that we have, uh, we are facing to uh, a lot of data that's coming in our way and how to manage that. And technology is far more advanced now. Okay, 
uh, that there was before. Uh, as an example, uh, uh, in, our, in, in my, you know, uh, Unity, we use a lot the Power BI. Um, I'm pretty sure a lot of people from audience uh, have knowledge about Power BI, which you have a lot of reporting out there uh, from different data, from, from different sources that you can use. Okay, so instead of uh, before, we used to spend hours and hours not just creating reporting, but extracting that to use for our uh, roles. Now you have it ready. The key here is, okay, the key here is how strategic you are, okay, yeah. uh, based on what you're trying to do now. As an example, you, you take, uh, for example, if I want to build, for example, I want to build a model that's going to show me uh, what, you know, this unit, how that is going to perform in two or three years from now. Strategically, I have to consider uh, in, in the reporting a lot of, uh, uh, you know, data, external data first, economic, uh, what kind of, you know, landscaping we have as far as changes in uh, re regulation, government, it's, it's one thing. Uh, the other piece is uh, what is the change in population? What is the need of the customer? Okay. And then you have the internal data, you look at the history, uh, you have a uh, look alike, you know, scenarios. And, and trying to build that. So, uh, uh, in other words, right now it's fundamental. It's very important that controllers right right now de develop that strategic mentality, uh, not just entry manual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a different story. Now, strategically, you got to think ahead. Uh, what what do I stay in the project in short term? How about long term? How you can get executive teams, okay, within uh uh in, in the you know to kind of i would say a phrase dance along with the project so they understand so every team understands that uh, so i think i think i think uh, uh, bottom line is got to think st strategically could yeah could could yeah. i add to that a little bit I, I, yeah absolutely that's great, please that's a great point and actually what the word i sort of use we're getting into talent later is really curiosity really i mean you have to be curious about how the customer buys and what happens is, because we've all been there, is you're so busy doing your job, do you really have time to go spend time with the sales force or the, the, the sales team or the marketing team or whatever, distribution, whatever it is? No, but you, you have to find the time and then you can then therefore have that dimensionality on the business to be strategic. And I think the, you know Julian's answer is great. I think the how is what I spend time with the people that I manage is how do you carve out the time to actually go build those relationships relationships and get that knowledge so that you have that dimensionality. Yeah. No, that's, uh, that's Dan, a good I'm going to pick up a, a cue there. The uh, freeing up the capacity and the bandwidth such that our teams can add value, add insights, drive better decision making, raise the financial aptitude of the entire organization. There's almost some preconditions. So what, what has to happen first? I sat in a meeting with a client recently and the CFO said, I want my people helping to manage the business, not manage the numbers. They would come to the meetings and everyone would have a different answer. So you'd have someone over here going, oh, well, <laughs> we made some updates to the actuals and we had to do a plug. We yeah. did some top sides and it's 100, not 95. The entire analysis over here, which was more uh, from like uh, the FP&A side buried in the business, they said, well, all our analysis came to 95. They would end up arguing and arguing over the five yeah. versus, you know, it's somewhat of a trivialized example, but those are all predecessors to being able to elevate ourselves to a strategic role. Yeah. Right. No, that's a, a great, uh, those are great examples. And yeah, the strategic role is really important and that ties in really well with kind of the next question I wanted to uh, explore with uh, with you guys, which is around collaboration with CFOs. So what are the, you know, as we're talking about strategic insights and, and controllers are no longer just kind of scorekeepers, uh, we're expected, they're expected to work together with the rest of finance teams, the operations, the business side, and provide strategic in, uh, insights. What are some of the kind of tips, tricks on how financial controllers can uh, truly collaborate more effectively with CFOs and with other uh, business partners to provide, to ensure that these insights are great. And Dan, you kind of touched on this, on creativity, on, on curiosity. Um, creativity is potentially another one. I would love to hear from, from you guys on how, what are some other ways that uh, financial controllers can collaborate 
uh, with CFOs and in order to provide that strategic insight. Uh, Philip, I'll start with you and then maybe Samantha, you can jump in. Sure. Um, and I'm, I'm going to weave in a couple of explicit examples because it popped into my mind this morning as I was thinking about, uh, you know, preparing for this panel discussion. Uh, one is, for me, establishing some clarity around roles and responsibilities. The evolution of the, the controller, as we're all clearly highlighting and amplifying, it's different than it was. But yeah. then you still have someone who's over here in FP&A or someone who's here in Treasury or someone who's here in operational finance clarity in support of the CFO and the mission and strategic objectives, we all collaborate. We have to collaborate in a cross-functional way, but we don't want to step on each other's toes. We, we shouldn't be doing the same things. We should be leveraging uh, the uh, better business processes based on best practices, the tools and technology, the emerging concepts. So me, first and foremost, clarity of the roles and responsibilities, and then how we support the CFO and the broader office of finance. Along with that is kind of aligning on those ultimate strategic goals are, hey, in our function, on our teams, we've got some kind of North Star objectives. We want to elevate the financial aptitude of the organization. We want to help them make better decisions. To do that, though, there's probably some other things, streamlining, automating, leverage technology wherever we can, uh, make the process of generating financial and management reporting seamless, push button, turnkey self-service, all of those different elements. Along with that then is, uh, we all know at the beginning, it's the data, data governance, data quality, getting out of the uh, tyranny of spreadsheets, which a lot of us still live in, not necessarily bad, but there's often a much, much better way, such that we're delivering accurate governed data and stewardship around that data. Uh, the curiosity certainly as Dan clearly highlighted is essential. But there's the element of the communication, the storytelling. Often the, the controllership function, they have unique insights around the way the end-to-end -end value chain of the business works. They have inherent knowledge that is just so powerful that can be better leveraged in the organization. An example that comes to mind is having worked in life sciences, an organization who had commercialized products. So they're heavily, heavily focused on gross to net revenue accounting and dealing with all the different providers and the government regulations, but they still have early stage products and things that are flipping over to commercial phase soon. That controllership function, we're responsible for all the arcane, complex, uh, mysterious accounting at times, but that was essential on a go forward basis to understand forward looking forecasts and direction of the firm. So how do you tap into that groundswell of information and insights that the world of the controllership has? Not the accounting side, but the forward-looking planning, decision-making, and analytics side. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, communication is always key. It's, it, you know, communication as well as uh, kind of being comfortable with iteration include by including the controllership function, right? Like, so you have use them as an input, I think, in those strategic discussions. Those are key. That's a... Great point, Philip. Uh, Samantha, did you have anything to add to that? I mean, everything Philip said is um, <clears throat> were things I would I would have to agree with, and things that I um, was thinking about saying. And I think a lot of it is also just cultivating amongst your team a strategic mindset. So I think in the past, our roles as controllers were really looking at the data and kind of trying to put it together in a very methodological way. Whereas now, I think as a controller should be taking on a more strategic mindset, um, understanding really the trends of the business, the, the competitive positioning, things like that. And by doing so, also sharing that with the team that is in your controllership. Um, I've personally benefited from taking some courses in emotional intelligence um, to better communicate and align with my CFO to see what if we can work together and really have him bring me into those conversations about business development and growth like that. Um, and mm -hmm. also I found that by being very proactive with risk, with risk management was also very helpful in this way. Um, controllers have the ability to have a little bit of insight into what the risks are and where they're coming from and how to mitigate them. And by being proactive and bringing that forward in those meetings and in those conversations, that's also a very good tool to use while working with your CFO. Yeah. Can, can, yeah. I, can I just build on that? Just sort of the, I, I didn't take a class in uh, emotional intelligence, but the if you want to make friends with the CFO, 
help your business be predictable. Um, and that is obviously something we all deal with, whether it's accruals or just visibility in general across. And that is getting back into that curiosity thing. And then, I, you know, Philip said something which I, I think CFOs struggle with a little bit, which is sort of the say do thing. Um, they're saying come with insights. Come, we don't want to talk about data. We don't want to argue about numbers. But they don't. But we, I guess I'll say, we don't invest in systems um, and automation because budgets are tight for GNA versus we obviously want to put the, the the money elsewhere in the business. And I see this just just on the RevRec side, in particular, just because everybody you know accountants love spreadsheets just because they like to see it all flow through um there's no greater visibility of anything like that than than the rev rec area and we, we 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 see businesses making that leap and it helps a lot but really those insights around the automation and the systems to actually actually allow you to have those conversations versus and this is what you do philip all day long is that automation for the digital transformation is critical so that you make you improve decision making uh, so we have another thing I want to add because yeah. everybody said, you know, nail it. Uh, uh, and and uh, one thing is for all the controllers or financial analysts in the audience or whoever is, is listening, be brave. Be brave. Knock on the door of CFOs, as Dan said. You know, you have to build that 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 bridge. You have to build the conversation. I've been in both sides. So, me, I'm waiting for the opportunity for my, you know, uh, whoever is, uh, is a financial analyst to come to me and say, Julian, you know what? I want to take... I want to take a chance to develop a long range plan. What are the pieces? Okay. Uh, how, how that is built? What are the components? Who I need to talk to? Okay. So, and then I say, wow, that's great. Here it is. I can help you, you know, uh, along with that plan. And, and, and please let me know what I need to do in addition to. So you kind of manage that. You prepare that the next CFO coming. But it is going to take, you know, it's going to start with us. It's going to start with financial analysts. It's going to start with, uh, uh, you know, uh, a system controller, whatever it might be, in order to become the next CFO. Yeah. And you guys all touched on some key um, uh, kind of changing, um, uh, you know, uh, activities and roles for the controller, uh, such as risk management, the method that you touched on, and Dan, uh, you talked about automation, et cetera. As as um, as these kind of um, uh, roles become more necessary, the risk management uh, risk management plays a bigger part of uh, controllerships. Um, kind of uh, again purview, um, and automation becomes much more on stream, and uh, it's required for data analysis and. And that digital transformation happens at a much more uh, broader scale. How do what can um, controllers do to best prepare for this? Uh, how can they? Uh, what are kind of best practices have that you guys have seen that can help them manage kind of the the automation and the new technologies while also maintaining that risk management because again you you know one of the main reasons why we excel can be will be pried out of my cold dead hands <laughs> is because it's it, i can trust it it's it's a steady it's it's something that i know it's stable um and that stability is is key how do you manage that in a dynamic world where controllership is often that steady hand Right, FPNA can kind of do new things, and business development, corp dev can do a lot of, and strategic uh, corp strategy can do a lot of fun things. But the the person kind of really holding things steady is controllership. So how do you manage when things are so dynamic? How can controllership or controllers manage this this kind of dichotomy? that exists um and dan i'll start with you and then maybe we can have so, uh, other people pitch in so i think this is visibility for the financial controller in terms of really thinking about what management's doing Could, to me that this is only unfortunately part of the overall operating system for a company the operating mechanisms it has uh around how are they delivering on the sales side how are they delivering on the marketing side etc whether 
there are strategic objectives, OKRs, whatever the whatever the acronym you're using or approach you're using. And so I think this fits within there um, because let's face it, um, I think we all learned from a few years ago. Um, we think we know what risk management is. It fits in a box. We sort of we list these things out. And then there are a whole bunch of things outside the box that we didn't ever think about, whether they're business specific risks, global risks, compliance risks, and on and on and on. Um, and I, and I do think it really does, unfortunately, kind of go back to the same thing, which is how closely are you integrated overall with the business as the financial controller? How do you fit in with that overall operating system? And, and then and then to your point, maybe specifically, I and mean, I'm just going to just because I, I, I see it a lot um, in our travels today, which is uh, since you mentioned the spreadsheet um, is it is it is the cold dead hand thing I, we see it all day long um, and it is it's just how we work. Um, but when the mistakes occur um, and you end up having compliance risks or audit problems or what have you, yeah. then what happens is people start to say there has to be there has to be a better way. We have to we have to evolve um, as our business and with our approach. But but I think um, overall, that risk management approach has to fit into an overall operating system, because let's face it, the number at the end of the day, we're the numbers, folks. Um, and we got to get that right. But hope, yeah, there has to be a broader system for us to fit into and plug in. Yeah, yeah. That's a great point. Anybody want to jump in? Yeah, Samantha, I can, I can add real quick here. Uh, uh, Dan, I, I love everything you said. It's exactly right. As far as control the piece. I can add one thing here is the key here is as a financial controller or a CFO, or whatever that might be in the finance team, it's important to keep the team, okay, uh, very, very informed. So anything that changes, anything that updates. As an example, um, like, you know, tomorrow I learned that, uh, uh, you know what, uh, I need to change some material uh, uh, impacts that happen. So I need to, you know, net that with some, you know, instead of expense, net, net it to uh, any revenue that might have. So how do you do that? Again, you have to keep, if it, that involves merchandising, involves operation, might involve uh, uh, HR, or it's going to be, you know, it's going to be maybe a warehouse thing, has to bring the team along and, discuss that communicate that uh just in time talking just in time communication don't let that go down the road without you know any discussion because it's going to be very very dangerous i'm going to jump in just on what julian is saying about communication i think um something that's very important in our new kind of development of our roles is the cross team communication like he was saying it's it's something that we as controllers or people may have perceived controllers in the past as people who stay in their offices heads down in the numbers <laughs> um and it's very important now that we are flexible in embracing change and that we can adapt to the changes and that we can we can be malleable with those things and then also involving those cross team communications that maybe in the past we wouldn't have had and having those open dynamic conversations about what our role is within the organization as well and what we bring to them and what they bring to us um you know it's like a two-way street and sometimes we as controllers forget that we need to kind of really embody and embrace all the other teams that we work with yeah, no, that's a great point. Uh, you know, fostering innovation, fostering all that. And that kind of uh, brings me to another uh, question is how do we how do we think about the fostering innovation and building a culture, especially when it comes to uh, talent development and and making sure that, you know, we have we have a, a dearth of talent in this in this uh you know, kind of a, a function. We you can never find enough, especially accountants, and especially in the controllership. So, uh, given that uh, kind of uh, talent development, team development, um, uh, you know, landscape. How? What are some of the tips and tricks that you guys have have found, and how can finance leaders really, you know, attract the right people here? and uh, build that culture for innovation, agile, my, you know, strategic thinking, et cetera. And Samantha, I'll just turn it back to you. And then, you know, as as you guys can jump in, Philip, um, sure. others yeah. as we as uh, as we uh, continue. Yeah. So a big thing that we fo that I focus on is developing my, for example, my assistant controller. Um, 
I think it's also about breaking those that narrative of what a controllership position really is all about now, and that in, involving your accounting team in understanding the business as a whole, I think has a huge impact on on talent and letting them understand where we how we impact the business. I know a lot of times it's the sales teams that get a lot of the the, the credit or the revenue generating uh, units that are, you know, the ones who get to see everything and tangibly. However, I think it's very important in order for us to, to grow as controllers and to have our teams grow is to really involve them in that. Be open to training and courses and things that might be outside the realm of controllership, but may have an added benefit to them. Um, we do a lot of cross across training in my role um, that's proven to be very effective you have people who can pick up and do other people's roles um, it's to me it's really about breaking down those barriers and breaking down those preconceived notions of what it is to be in an accounting position within an in, within the industry and to really um, be able to see the fruits of their labor i find is also very important because sometimes you know we as controllers, our, our main job is to spit out those financial statements at the end of the month. And in previous times, it was maybe the CFO or the fp and team that would take that, that information and share it and tell the story behind it. But now I find that by because we're automating so many processes and because we're growing and we want to develop those skills to analytics and strategic thinking, that we are able to kind of be those people and be the voice of the numbers and tell those stories. And I think that has proven to be, in my in my experience, that has proven to be very effective in, in uh, engaging the people on my team because you feel like you're part of the bigger picture and you're not just, uh, you know, money, hands down, looking down at the, at the spreadsheets, doing your pivot tables. Um, and I think, it's, yeah. I think it's become very, very important in our roles to be able to to reach the other teams, um, something also we do, and I'm I'm sure others do it too, is that we do like lunch and learns for our our uh, other teams who might yeah. not have any understanding of finance, or maybe they've never seen right. a financial statement. So then we kind of show what our role is in a broader capacity as well, and I find that's also been very key of keeping my people engaged on our team. Well, that's a great point. I love lunch and learn. <laughs> Philip, did you have anything to yes, add? Yes, I did. It 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 Samantha, you've triggered away a whole series of different thoughts in my mind. A couple of years ago, I was helping an organization uh, in academics. They're one of the largest uh, global online institutions in the world. And they had a new uh, COO who was de facto CFO came in, evaluated his talent pool across accounting, across finance. They didn't even call it FP&A. They were the budgets team. And he looked at it and said, this is wrong. This is completely wrong. I need to baseline slash rebaseline. So it started with what am I slash we looking for in the roles of all these different people? So establish first, we're going to, what's the idealized state? And then evaluate all the individuals across these different criteria and say, do they have the aptitude? Do they have the attitude? Do they have the curiosity? Because we need to be way up here, like a top quartile. We're not there today. And not that the people can't do it. They haven't been trained. They haven't been given the opportunities. They lived in their silos. You know, you can keep going and keep going where fast forward, they've completely transformed the totality of finance and specifically things like controlling. They're different now. They're actually business partners. They're working very closely with academic affairs, marketing, the other constituents across the, the university to drive change. And certain people have arrived in that environment. Others take longer because it's it's hard. Change is hard. You're learning new skills. It's it's different. It's not we're never suggesting it's easy, but when you avail them of the opportunities, human beings tend to like new things. Change can be hard, but give them the opportunities, give them the training, give them the tools, and they can be very successful. Can I can I just on the on the change thing that, that is so um, I think we're all seeing this, whether it's from AI or from whatever, whatever the driver is, you see it in I'm even in retail. I mean, so is business models are changing, they're evolving, they're getting more complex, not less complex. Uh, and so besides just the base sort of ability, um, we're all sort of looking for that, of course. Um, I, I, the word I would use is agility. Um, and that is somebody who is really, I mean, I'll, I'll actually say myself, when I was in that controller role, I set everything up. Everything was perfect. 
don't give me something new. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, and and um, it's it's exactly the opposite. Obviously, today, um, if you take that approach, you're just you're just done. Um, you really need to be able to evolve and be. You have to embrace those changes, um, as you were saying, Philip, and that agility, both intellectually but also skill wise, um, to be able to build the. I, I kind of always say the capability of the organization, whether it's the people or the systems, to be able to support um, those changes. That's great. Uh, I totally agree. I mean, it's uh, it's a new new way of interacting with the uh, with the uh, larger organization for sure, and with your own team. Uh, what are some of the kind of um, ways that you guys have found, and this is broad to demonstrating, measuring, and demonstrating the value of controllership function? How do you guys see that evolving and how do you guys what are some of the challenges faced some ideas on how can controllers uh, currently measure and demonstrate the value of their team to the broader organization how does how has that kind of evolved from what you've seen and i'll open it up to whomever uh julian and then uh maybe somebody else if i may i can go first sorry team uh Great, great question. Great question. And it's, it's so, so, uh, you know, valid nowadays that never before. When I look at those, you know, my team uh, and certain individuals, I look for two characteristics, which I develop. Uh, I'm, I'm keen on developing. The first one is value. Value. What does it mean by that? Is I'm looking is a value is skills or attitude. I pick the right attitude. Here, here, here is why. It's, it's very because I've been in my career, you know, uh, and, mm -hmm. and I have a, a great examples of that. For me, attitude is number one. The reason is because you're willing to participate. You're willing to go outside the box and learn new skills. Okay. And then you raise your hand. You, you go and say, okay, I'm going to take to these, you know, on this project because I know that it's not, you know, uh, uh, it, it doesn't fall under my duties, but I'm willing to go above and beyond because I want to be the next CFO. I want to be, be the next CEO, whatever might be the case. So the attitude is right. Skills, you can teach skills anytime. OK, but you got to have the right attitude. The other one, the other one, uh, which I think they are equally important. But OK, the other one is trust. Trust is if I. You know, and I, I've been in, and I have a lot of examples here in my, uh, uh, I've been in West Coast, uh, uh, you know, as CFO for Kroger, East Coast and all. So what I learned there and what, I, what I'm promoting as well is, is the trust in the way that I'm giving you in a project, right? You got to tell me the truth. Okay. And you got to tell me the truth in a way that not just as you see it, but timely as well. How many times and you know, uh, controllers or CFOs be in a situation where, you know what, now, oh my God, I have this $2 million that's gonna hit me in the next week, and should I tell my CEO or not? That's the difference. You should notify your CEO, your team right away, either way. If it's a good thing, uh, I'm first. I can go say, you know what, <laughs> boss, we got it. $2 million is our way. How about when it's unfavorable? So that's the thing you build the trust. You build the trust, and then you have that person, you have that team forever glued to you. And this is how that goes. And that's a great point. And the trust, it goes both ways. And to that point, we actually have a um, um, audience question that asks the other uh, kind of the other way is how can organizations support controllers? as they transition into this more strategic role that is much more expanded than they've had in the past. So what have, and that's a great, great question. Um, and so, you know, I just would love to get your thoughts on it. Uh, Dan, Philip, do you guys have any ideas? Uh, can, can I continue since mm -hmm. I am in this? Oh yeah, I'm sorry, quick. go ahead. Uh, excellent, I can go the other way now. How, yeah, how, yeah, how, how they can support. And again, these are live examples too. As a CFO, as a controller, you have to become visible. They got to hear your voice. Try to go around the cubes, try to go around their offices, say good morning, go from the fifth floor to the fourth floor to the first floor. 
say hi to people, explain the position, explain the situations, okay? Build bonds. And this is how you develop the, the, the trust. Because uh, can you imagine, you know, I have two, two scenarios here real quick. I have one person that I say good morning every day or every other day. And I have a person that I see every six months. Which one is going to, you know, serve me most or have a trust? The first one. So yeah. be vocal, be, be visible, communicate, communicate, communicate. Yeah, that's a great point. Communication is key. Anything else to add? The one thing I'll add is because uh, we really we have multiple stages and of, of companies he, uh, uh, here. Um, uh, at some point, the planning side and the actuals come together. And um, I guess my point, I'm just going to say, but when you have the sort of the person who's just dealing with the accounting and not dealing with the planning piece, um, yeah, I think to answer your question, you've got to bring that person's skills along slowly. You cannot just throw them into the fire and suddenly say, "We're." I mean, I'll just say the extreme example: we're a public company. You, you know, you're you're suddenly got to be able to figure all of this stuff out, and we got to right. we got an earnings release in six weeks. So, um, right. just I think just bringing those people along. Um, I, I just quickly what happened. I I got thrown into that role, fortunately, for a very early stage company and develop the skills as the company grew. Um, so it just sort of depends how that happens. Uh, but but ultimately, that is a very, very, very different skill set. Uh, and so mentoring those folks um, versus yeah. just throwing them into the fire. Yeah, upskilling is key. Upskilling mm -hmm. and uh, doing the, you know, uh, all the uh, helping them understand data analytics, strategic planning, what that even entails. I think it's key. Good. Um, so it, a, did a quick one, yeah, quick one, because Dan, you, you called this out earlier. It's the say as I do or do as I say, whatever, whatever the dynamic. As an executive leadership team, yes, we're going to invest in the cutting edge technology for customer facing experiences, how we deliver goods and services or how we expedite things through our supply chain. And they're like, oh, wow, yeah. Unlimited wants and limited resources and what's get, what gets whacked. The GNA, to your point, the GNA side, often that can do a disservice to the value prop that controllership and broader finance can bring to bear. Yes, we have to have our ROIs and our value proposition. But once we start demonstrating the value we add, the organizations, it, organizations it's incumbent upon them to help prioritize and maybe reprioritize potential investments to free up the capacity, mm -hmm. the time invest in automation, invest in technology, such that the controllers can spend time on the value added insights, inclusive of training, education, opportunities, and so forth. Yeah, we're, uh, you know, one of the big things is that often finance is seen as a cost center. So, uh, you know, organizations that don't that. see finance as a cost center and really invest in it are the ones that really get the really big dynamic CFOs. Anything more to add, Samantha? I just, I, I you just resonates with what you said about the call center. Um, that's something that I have been, you know, advocating for that we are a lot more than a call center finance, right. that if there was no right. finance, you'd have no strategic business decisions to make and you wouldn't have the data. And I think that's actually a mindset that going forward, companies are going to actually have no choice but to adapt, like adopt because it, we are not just a cost center and it becomes, you know, increasingly frustrating when people um, view it that way and, and don't really involve the controller side of things into the, into the business. So I think for the question what companies can do, I think it's exactly that upskilling, uh, mentoring and really allowing the team to feel as though they are part of the um, integral part of the business and not just that cost center sitting in the basement. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And on that, uh, you know, topic about upskilling and uh, tools and getting new technology, uh, one of the audience questions was um, related to that. So what tools and technologies have you guys found to be most effective in identifying potential uh, financial risks early and really, you know, help with the controllership functions? Um, Anybody want to take a crack? Um, Julian, Philip, I think, and Dan, uh, Samantha. I, 
It's I, totally up to you guys, whoever wants to I, jump in. I'll let I wonder if folks do a, maybe a current situation. I can maybe talk a little bit about where it's going. Yeah. But well, I, I can go ahead as far as the tools uh, that you look at, uh, uh, you know, technology is most effective to find potential financial uh, risk early. Uh, it's it's the way I mean, the way how we build it is uh, you look at, first of all, uh, you know, if you are a public company, you guys, you are bound to start, start being Soxley. You got to, you know, uh, m make sure all the checks and balances you are within the frame there and, and you kind of build the tools uh, as far as effective the tools. Again, it depends. It depends what it goes. So if you're looking for a risk as far as, let's say you have a risk, you kind of, you know, have a, uh, a store that, uh, or a unit that you're trying to build a financial, you know, in five years where we're going. The risk is if you, if you, if you think, if you put in your model that, you know what, uh, that place uh, or the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the surrounding areas will, will, you know, population will increase by 2%. You got to be mindful to that. So you put the tools in place there. You put, you put the checks and balances, making sure that you really uh, are going to towards the target. If not, and the whole the whole you know uh, investment is going to fail. So this is one you know one of the tools you you you, you can. Uh, there are other things too, as far as uh, when you look at with respect to expenses, uh, you think that you know. Uh, not, not the first thing that comes to my mind is like, how do you manage COVID? How do you know it's going to happen? I don't know. So you build like the caution there towards unknowns. Yeah. And I, oh, go, go ahead, Philip, and then I'll go. Yeah, real quickly, I'd, I'd layer that in. You, Julian, you got me thinking of a, another client of ours, you know, springboard on from COVID, but the, the reality of today, they're a very large automotive retailer. And they also have a captive finance company. So guess what? We just had a presidential election and the winds change. And the wind blows different directions interest rates are exceedingly important for them. So they're constantly running scenarios and simulations and getting to the point of saying, let's not just do contingency planning, but let's create an operational playbook. Yeah. If things manifest in a certain way, what will we, the organization, be prepared to do for a more dynamic allocate resources, reallocate resources, in some sense, regardless of the tool we're doing it in, but have the modeling framework and the capacity as an organization to move based on the assumptions and the output and what materializes. Yeah, that I'm just going to, that's exactly a perfect lead into this sort of kind of, we've all heard of uh, software as a service and now there's service as a software that's all evolving with these sort of agent based approaches, agentic, whatever. Um, and just to use Philip's example, right? I mean, it's, we have good process, right? You kind of do a weekly forecast update. You look at probabilities, whatever you look at trends and, all of the math we get good at, we humans are pretty good at these things, but we're doing them in a discrete sort of process, right? And if you start to think about, and I'm sorry to do this, but sort of an AI approach where you're constantly sort of doing, these engines are doing this stuff based upon all of the myriad of inputs, um, you can start to see a world where it could actually get better. Um, obviously humans need to come in and apply judgment, but it is an exciting sort of sort of something that's sort of, I guess I would say bleeding edge, um, maybe into cutting edge a little bit right now. Um, but I think that approach certainly over the next few years is where um, if we had one of these panels in a few years, I, I actually think some of us would have some of these things implemented. Yeah, that's a good point. And that uh, leads into a really good audience question here, which is in the future, um, uh, you know, as we're evolving and given this financial landscape, what does that ideal relationship between CFOs and controllers look like? Um, uh, you know, and what is it going to evolve to? Samantha, I'll turn it over to you and then uh, all of you guys can uh, jump in after that. Um, I think the future really looks um, at controllership and CFO relationships as two partners who are working together to achieve a common goal. Um, I think by connecting the financial data that controllers put out and having those open conversations and looking at it, I think someone on the panel said as a business partner relationship with your CFO, that that's really where the future is headed. Um, it, I believe it's going to be a very collaborative um, relationship and it has to be a collaborative relationship and the controller is going to, you know, eventually will have that insight to help the CFO with those plannings and with those forward thinking um, 
projects or you know helping bring the business to the next level i think it's good the future really is a collaborative relationship between the two and removing those silos of data and strategy and merging them together and working together as a team that's a great point and we have 10 seconds remaining if anybody wants to jump in and say anything uh, re 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 real quick here. I don't think it's an ideal situation. Uh, I think the thing is that we, we can go to dinner every other night. No, I'm kidding here. Uh, as far as CFO and controller, the true is telling the story, telling the same story with, with different words. So meaning we yeah. are on the same page. Yeah. Great job, Shweta. Yeah. Yep. Great. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. You were all great. And, and thank you all for such an insightful panel discussion. And I want to thank everyone else for joining us today. This session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand following the event. For those of you who earned points throughout today's event, an Argyle team member will be following up with the winners in the next couple of weeks. This officially concludes the Argyle Financial Controller Leadership Forum, Predict, Plan, Prepare. Thank you again for joining us today and engaging in our content. We look forward to seeing you at our next Argyle Digital Finance event soon, which will be our CFO Leadership Forum, Lessons Learned in 2024, on December 17th, 2024. Have a great rest of your day.